Welcome to the Green Left Report, media for the 99%. I'm Simon Butler. And I'm Mel Barnes. In this show, we'll speak with a journalist from Sri Lanka who has been forced to flee the country. Sri Lanka is one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a journalist. We'll also ask him what the situation is really like for Tamils in his country. And we'll speak to Carl Han from Community Action Against Homophobia about the steps forward in their campaign for marriage equality. And we'll hear again from Carla Sands. But first, some activist news. A one-day strike saw 40,000 teachers in Victoria stop work on September 5, in protest at the government's refusal to improve teachers' pay and conditions. At a mass meeting of the Australian Education Union on the day, 15,000 members voted to continue the work bans. Five anti-coal protests took place over four consecutive days last week. The first action took place in Melbourne on September 3, where four members of Quick Coal climbed the roof of Victoria's Parliament House and unfurled a huge 86 square metre banner. On the same day, two protesters climbed equipment at the Bogabai coal mine in New South Wales to protest plans for its expansion. The next day, 84-year-old bird watcher Russ Watts chained himself to a gate of the same mine. All three protesters were arrested and charged with hindering working of mining equipment. That's an offence which carries a maximum seven-year jail term. On September 5, rising tide closed a railway being built to transport coal in Rutherford near Maitland in New South Wales. They said that this railway has been built purely for the coal companies to use, yet it's been paid for with taxpayers' money. The next day, rising tide activists stopped work on a new coal loading facility in Newcastle Harbour after two activists scaled a crane. Bashana Abawardena is a member of Journalists for Democracy in Sri Lanka, a group for Sri Lankan journalists who have been forced to flee the country. He was in Australia last week to promote a new film called Silenced Voices. The Green Left Report asked him about the danger journalists face in Sri Lanka. It has always been dangerous and a risky job in Sri Lanka, but within the last uh, 10 years at least, things have got worse. When the government started pursuing a military option, and anyone who actually dis disputed with the government's position was immediately, you know, had to go into trouble because, I mean, they are, you, can, you can have quite a lot of differences with the government as long as it doesn't deal with the crucial issues like the issue of the Tamil people. Mm -hmm. It is important for them to suppress the true information coming out of Sri Lanka and pretend that we don't know actually what is going on in Sri Lanka and we think because the war ended everything is okay. Mm -hmm. So this is this is not because that they don't know the facts. Mm -hmm. It is because that they want to pretend that they won't they don't know the facts. Mm -hmm. Since uh, April 2004 when the when the current government came into power up till now 44 media workers have uh, either disappeared or died mm -hmm. not killed. Maybe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but no single perpetrator has been brought to book so mm. far. We also asked Abu Wadna to respond to Deputy Opposition Leader Julie Bishop, who recently said all Tamil asylum seekers should be sent back to Sri Lanka without having their refugee claims processed. I think this kind of statement is disgraceful mm. to any accepted democratic and internationally accepted uh, moral I mean, uh, uh, standards. I mean, permanent state of fear has been I mean, deliberately maintained by the Sri Lankan state uh, in the whole of Tamil region. For example, I mean, Tamil people are inhabiting about 18,000 square kilometres in the north and eastern region, and out of that, 7,000 square kilometres, even three years after the war, has been occupied by the Sri Lankan military. So it means one third of the area has been uh, completely occupied by the army three years after the war, and the, it, it simply brings out the fact that the level of militarization has increased after the war. There's a one soldier for every five people living in Jaffna, which means normally a traditional Tamil family would have five members in the family. Mm, so so you get five. one soldier mm. to every family. It's like that. Mm. That that in, um, that reflects the, uh, the true nature of the militarization. 200,000, more than 200,000 people are still living in transit camps and host, with host families because they are not allowed to go to the la original lands they, are, they, you know, they used to live. So, I mean, who would like to live in such a situation? I mean, if someone says, I mean, the people who are coming in boats, I mean, getting onto a boat and trying to uh, reach Australian shores of Australia, mm. I mean, you would not like to 
live in a situation where I mean uh, one third of your I mean area is been uh, occupied by the military, and you have every I mean for every family has one soldier to look after them, mm. and at the same time, uh, they are not I mean when when you are not allowed to go and live in the place you 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 belong to, and also the level of uh, abductions because the most recent report says there's one person goes missing every five days. You don't have a life under that conditions. If you look at from that point of view, I think such a statement. It not only ignores the accepted democratic norms, but actually it's a violation. It's a, I mean, it's a violation of the international obligations that the Australian government is bound to protect. But at the same time, it's I mean, it's a disgraceful thing from the point of view of the humanitarian aspect of you know anyone as a human being. You cannot say such things without uh, actually getting the facts correctly. The director of the film, Berta Arnstead, is also in Australia, and she told us what motivated her to make the film. I want to highlight the importance of journalists. It's not only in Sri Lanka, you know, journalists are being threatened in many countries. Uh, and, you know, when journalists are threatened, uh, we don't get truth at what's going on. And if you don't have journalists in a, in a, in a country, you know, the, uh, you know, the whole democracy is, is uh, democracies are jeopardized. And now for some more activist news. Protesters outside the Perth office of MP Julie Bishop on September 7 voiced their anger at her recent comments that all Tamil refugees in Australia should be sent back to Sri Lanka. Julie Bishop, you can't hide! You're supporting genocide! Julie Bishop, you can't hide! You're supporting genocide! In the closing month of the war in 2009, 50,000 civilians were killed, with hospitals deliberately targeted by the government of Sri Lanka forces. 150,000 civilians remain missing. 300,000 civilians were rounded up and put into concentration camps. Julie Bishop, blood on your hands! That protest was organised by the Refugee Rights Action Network of Western Australia and a new group called Network for Human Rights in Tamil Elam and Sri Lanka. The network also hosted a discussion with Dr. Brian Sinwaratna on September 1. He told the audience that human rights in Sri Lanka are worse than ever. First, why have you got that over? It is an internal affair. No, it's not. The violation of human rights is not an internal affair of that country. That is why we got involved in apartheid South Africa, which is a very much an internal affair of South Africa. Secondly, that the fallout on these countries in the way of asylum seekers and refugees. And thirdly, when the chaos is over, the rebuilding of this country will fall on us, as happened with East Timor. That is why we should get involved. Youth group resistance staged protest outside Hungry Jacks in six cities around Australia on August 31. They're angry at attempts by Hungry Jacks to take away weekend penalty rates for its workers. Workers' rights are under attack. Who do we blame? Hungry Jacks. This is a company that earns hundreds of millions of dollars in Australia alone, not even talking about internationally. And they're crying poor, saying they can't even pay their workers penalty rates on the weekend. Prime Minister Julia Gillard received a hostile reception at Curtin University in Perth on September 5. Students criticised her government's position on same-sex marriage and refugees. Julia Gillard, you are not welcome here! Racist, sexist, anti-queer! Anti Gillard, you're not welcome here! Racist, sexist, anti-queer! Gillard, you're not welcome here! I'm here today because I've got a beautiful girlfriend that I really love. It'd be really nice if maybe one day I'd be able to marry her. I come here to protest for equal rights for refugees and to say no to Julia Gillard's inhumane offshore processing. Shame Gillard, shame! Shame Gillard, shame! 150 people protested outside the newly opened Northern Detention Centre in Western Australia on August 26. They demanded an end to mandatory detention and offshore processing. Green Senator Scott Ludlam spoke at the protest. The basic contention here is that we will lock these people up as an example to others. It doesn't matter if it makes them mentally ill. It doesn't matter if it makes them self-harm. It doesn't matter if they kill themselves. They are to be locked up as an example to other people who will be then somehow magically persuaded to stay at home in a war zone or facing genocide or ethnic cleansing or whatever the prevailing circumstances are where folk come from. I'm heartened actually to be amongst friends and to be reminded that this is not the Australia that I want to live in. This is not the terms of the debate that we shall allow to be set. It's not
The campaign to win marriage equality has been strengthened with Tasmania's lower house passing marriage equality legislation in that state. South Australia has said it will follow suit. Joining us now is Carl Han, an activist with the Sydney group Community Action Against Homophobia. Welcome, Carl. Thanks, Simon. Carl, could you talk about the significance of a Tasmanian lower house vote just the other day? Oh, it's a big encouragement for those of us who are involved in um, organising for marriage equality. I think at the start of 2012, we felt a little bit set back by everything that had happened with the Labor Party kind of theoretically supporting us, but then actually acting to stop marriage equality from happening by allowing a conscience vote. So the fact that there's a bit of a change and that states are going to have a go at doing it there and that there's a possibility that we'll get through, it means that we don't have to wait for Tony Abbott to be done with with whatever happens in Parliament. We can actually get it on a state level and it means we've got something we can work towards. So I think people are really encouraged by it. I think it's going to stir up a bit of action on the street as well that people will get back into that. So. That's good. So if Tasmania passes it, does that mean, um, can the federal government overturn that legislation? Chances are, if the government do try and overturn it, it'll go to the Supreme Court Mm -hmm. and the Supreme Court decision will set a precedent for what, what they're able to do in that situation. But the other thing is it'll be interesting for the federal government, which is a Labor government, to bring an action against the Tasmanian state government, which is also a Labor government, and that would put a bit of pressure on them maybe to reveal where they stand on the issue. You're a Christian pastor, uh, and last week we heard comments from the Australian Christian Lobby spokesperson Jim Wallace who said that being gay is worse than smoking for your health. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I mean, that's a pretty outrageous uh, thing to say, uh, and it it caused a lot of controversy. Yeah. Uh, What's your take on that as a Christian? Well, it's a little bit embarrassing. I actually think a lot of conservative Christians and a lot of people who aren't thrilled about the idea that their um, gay marriage is going to happen still would not want to be associated with the kind of extreme rhetoric that comes out of Jim Wallace. But it all ties back into the way that Christians have framed their their kind of anti-gay rhetoric over the years has been to say, well, we don't have anything against you personally, but... Um, what you do is immoral and maybe you're psychologically disturbed maybe you need a bit of therapy and you probably can't raise kids you'd screw them up they'd all turn out gay or something like that and so a lot of that stuff has been debunked to that comment about smoking being gay lowers your life expectancy I mean maybe that's because a lot of gay kids commit suicide maybe it's because there's not a cure for HIV yet. There's a lot of reasons for it. They want to say it's because it's gay. So it's pretty nasty rhetoric. And hopefully the result of that will be that good Christian people will look at that and say, well, I don't want to be associated with that. So maybe I can think critically about the positions that are being put to me by my church and the leaders of my religion. And that would be a really good thing. Julia Gillard was due to give a speech at a function for the Australian Christian Love. <laughs> she, she pulled out of it after Jim Wallace's comments that smoking is, is, yeah. is better for you than being gay or lesbian. And I guess I wanted to ask a bit, what about her position on equal marriage herself? Well, that's the thing, is that Jim Wallace comes out with all these crazy words, but the marriage ban is actually coming from the parliament. Mm. So I'd prefer to go and speak at the conference and give us marriage equality. I think she was probably looking for an out anyway. I don't know how she ended up agreeing to speak at a conference like that, but it probably wasn't going to be great PR for her. So that was her out, and she was smart to take it. But if she's going to pull out for a reason like that, I think it'd be good to back it up with a bit of action. Polls are showing that most people in Australia support marriage equality, so why isn't Gillard jumping on it? Well, it's a mystery, isn't it? It's Nobody understands why this person who, so, well, so legend has it, was involved in radical feminist and pro-gay politics when she was at university, kind of got sucked into parliament and had all of her radical leanings I don't know, drenched out of it. I don't know what they do to people in Parliament, but they always seem to end up... It's a pretty, it's a pretty <laughs> if you would end up in Parliament. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't understand what a position is, but I wonder if there was some sort of an agreement between her and the Australian Christian Lobby and it had to do with securing a block of votes somewhere or something like that, but you can only speculate. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking to us about that. Thank you. Yeah. And next up, we have Carlo Sands. G'day, I'm Carlos Sands, and this is my corner. 
my last corner, I was discussing the huge impact Gina Reinhart's poultry has had on Australian politics, with the federal government giving her a visa to super exploit foreign workers like she called for. Well, since then, she has made headlines around the world with her latest intervention into Australian politics, slamming Australian workers for being far too lazy and far too overpaid, and arguing that if they want to get rich like her, they need to work a lot longer for a lot less pointing to the African workforce that works long hours for $2 a day. Well, this time, far from the brilliant influence of her poem, she's generated huge outrage everywhere. It's not hard to see where she's gone wrong. They've forgotten the lessons of her first poem. This time, she didn't even bother to make her political arguments rhyme. There was not even one rhyming couplet in this. Even worse, her poem was marked by bold originality in its publishing format. Understanding that paper is basically a 20th century form, she had it engraved on a giant lump of iron ore and stuck in the Perth suburb of Morley. What did she do this time? She made a video, people watched it on YouTube. Any pleb can make a video on YouTube. How bloody common. She's lost her touch. And here's what I think that she needs to do. I think she needs to take an inspiration from one of her fellow billionaires, someone who's used brain power to get where they are, Clive Palmer. He is a man who's looked at the state of the world and seen war, poverty, famine, and said, I'm a billionaire. What can I do? I know. I'll rebuild the Titanic. Some lesser minds have said, that's a bit bloody weird, Clive. You want to rebuild a ship that sunk 100 years ago, killed 1,500 people in one of the worst maritime accidents in history and turn it into a tourism attraction. That is why Clive Palmer is a billionaire and those losers aren't. He's looked at what sunk the Titanic the first time round. Giant iceberg. So once global warming melts all of the ice, he's got himself an unsinkable ship. Captain Clive with his unsinkable Titanic, the same time as rising sea levels, going to make islands go under, coastal cities uninhabitable, all these millions of people looking for somewhere safe. There he'll be like Noah and his ark. Only Clive Palmer is not some bearded hippie. He's not going to be letting on just two of every animal. Paying customers only. Squirrels can get lost. Possums? It's not Clive Palmer's fault. You didn't make your money in the mining boom. You had as much chance as the rest of us. This is the genius of the man. He's found out a way to continue making money even when the eco-holocaust hits. And to think, some bastards actually want him to pay tax. What the hell's wrong with this country? I'm Carlo Sands, and that was my corner. Thanks, Carlo. Before we go, we'd like to thank everyone who donated to our special appeal. We raised over $50,000 in two months, so thank you very, very much. Yes, thank you. However, that was still short of our $60,000 target and we still need your support. So you can donate to Greenleft TV. The details are on screen now. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Goodbye. Function. Not for those with a deficit in gumption When there's a life, there's a societal function